So I will give a brief resume of his CV, which is uh, pretty long, and one cannot do justice uh, in a few minutes, but I'm sure you've come to listen to him speak rather than me give a resume on him. Um, Professor Thomas McElwain, also known as Ali Haider, um, is of American origin, and uh, he was trained as a Baptist minister. Part of his training was done in France, where he met his future wife, Rita, who was also training there. And uh, she was from Finland, and after marrying, he moved over to Finland. He practiced as a Batman, Bat Baptist minister, and became a professor, or he likes to be called a docent in his modest way, rather than a professor, of comparative religion. Um, in doing his studies on comparative religion, he also studied um, Islam, and he told us the other day that uh, while he was in London, while he was in Britain, traveling from Edinburgh to London, he studied the translation of the Holy Quran on the train from Edinburgh um, to London, a six hour ride. And he said he looked at it with the eyes of a Baptist minister, a person who had already accepted Christ to Hazrat Isa salam, in his life. So he wanted to compare in his mind whether the Quran had the same truth as the Bible had. And uh, at the end of his journey, that is when he reached London, he had decided to take the Shahada. So he uh, took the Shahada as soon as he reached London. And he's also uh, been for Hajj. He's written many publications. But his magnum opus, his largest work that he's done, has been over 10 years when he confined himself in his home, which is in a cabin on the outskirts of a forest in Finland. And these 10 years he, he spent studying the original Torah, the Injil, the Bible, the Ethiopian scriptures, and the Quran. And he's written a translation in verse on the Torah, the Injil, and the Quran. Um, it's a magnificent piece of work. Um, I've had the privilege of looking at uh, part of the translation, and it's absolutely brilliant. He's written in verse, and he's also written a commentary on the parts that he felt required a commentary. But the marvelous thing is that even the commentary is written in verse. Um, if anyone would like a copy, it, it is in five volumes. Um, anyone want a copy of this, you can contact Abbas Shah, who is sitting in front here. And uh, he said he's prepared to uh, post it to you for a small fee. <laughs> um, uh, with that, um, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Haider Ali, Tom McElwin to uh, give us a discourse. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, ashadu anna muhammadan rasulullah. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. Tawheed. Um, Sheikh Fadlallah asked me to present the unifying characteristic that I found in the beloved and I, 
what unifies the sacred books. And if there's anything that unifies them, it is Tawheed. From beginning to end, this message is repeated again and again and again. In my book, Islam in the Bible, I have two chapters on this subject, taking 60 or 70 passages from the Bible which explicitly state that God is one, one only. There is no God but I, as is said in Isaiah. In fact, with a little humor, there is no God but I. And I alone, at least I don't know any other. And I find some humor in the Quran as well. But I told you a couple of days ago that I was an unbeliever. And I could tell it by the fact that I sometimes let time pass by before I go and do my salat. And uh, that shows that I don't really believe in the Day of Judgment. Because if I did, I would be there on the second. Because from one breath to another, we are dependent on Allah for life. If Allah for only a moment stopped giving us the kiss of life, we would cease to exist, which is probably why we don't hear him speaking. He is too busy kissing us. But um, I was a teenager and I was, there was a teenager who came and spoke to me, a very bright young man and bright, I mean glistening with uh, Nur Allah. And uh, it reminded me of myself. I was a very uh, precocious teenager like most teenagers. They are kicking footballs and you think they're just kicking footballs but in fact they're reinventing Aristotelian logic. And any parent knows that this is true. But uh, there's with all of the fantastic logic a teenager has, and I certainly had it, I'd read my Plato and Aristotle and even my Thomas Aquinas, which is quite an extensive work by the time I was 15. And um, I had a teacher. I went to a private school that my parents put me in and they had religion classes. And the religion teacher out of 400 pupils was so kind that he uh, offered to teach me um, both Biblical Hebrew and Greek. So he was taking me two hours a week, mashallah, without any payment. Not that I even entered my teenage mind to reimburse him for his time. Um, teenagers are able to think like Aristotle, but they're not able to remember or even think that it's their mother who puts the milk on the table. But they wake up soon and very often their interests become only football when they get adult. Fortunately, my development was arrested at the age of 19. He was a wonderful man and he, he was teaching me the Hebrew so I could read the Bible in the original language. And this is something that Christians could learn from Muslims and Jews. Why read the books only in your native language? Why not read them in the original as well? Um, and the result of this is what, uh, um, who was it? Uh, one sheikh uh, s said to me, I think yesterday, that uh, the governor of Texas said that uh, if English was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for everyone else. And that, so if the 
King James Version was good enough for Jesus should be good enough for everyone else. And this is the result of not reading the Bible in the original language. Um, so I, I got this lovely training from this lovely man and he started teaching me Hebrew from the beginning of the Bible. Bereshith bara Elohim Et ha-shamayim v'et ha-aretz. In the first letter is Beit. It's strange, the Bible begins with a B, not with an A. It's the B, Beit, which means house, of course. And the Quran also begins with Ba. But there's a difference between the... I'm telling you this because I want to tell you in one brief word what the difference is between the Bible and the Quran. The Hebrew Beit looks somewhat like the uh, Ba in Arabic. There's one difference. In Hebrew, the point is in the heart of the letter, in the middle of the letter. It's hidden inside the letter, it's in the heart. And there are many things that are not clear in the Bible, and many dangling strings, and many things you could wonder about. And I discovered that in the Quran, those ambiguous things, the cloudy issues, the things I wondered about, suddenly were made clear. And the point hidden in the heart of the bait is found outside the Ba, where everyone can see it and understand it. So the Quran completes the revelation. You know, I'm tired of the battle of the books. I read the Quran and I saw that it was teaching what I believed from reading the Bible. One of those issues was Tawheed, the oneness of God. And any issue from Islam that you can bring forward, take for example Salah, prayer. Every gesture of Salat is mentioned somewhere in the Bible at least once. Many of them mentioned 30 or 40 times. It's a thick book. In the Beloved and I, the biblical portion is eight volumes and the Quran is the ninth. So there's a lot of material there. Those, this gesture is mentioned many times. This gesture is mentioned and Yigdal Adonai, which is the same as Allahu Akbar, translated. Um, every word of Salah, every word of Al-Fatiha is found somewhere in the Bible every expression. And uh, this is typical in the first century, you find uh, um, that prayers were made by taking a phrase here and a phrase there from the prophets in the Bible, putting them together. And this is exactly uh, what uh, Al-Fatiha is. There is a continuity. There is only one book of Revelation. I'm not saying the Bible is perfect or perfectly transmitted. It's a house with a locked window and a locked door encrusted with um, the patina of ages and the Quran opens a storehouse uh, of the Bible, clarifies it. Tawhid from the very first verse of the Bible to the last ayat 
of the Quran is the central theme. And my message to everyone I meet is this one thing, Tawheed, because everything else is derived from it. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church says that all Roman Catholic doctrine is derived from the doctrine of the Trinity. I just discovered that a few weeks ago. But truth is derived from Tawheed. La ilaha illallah. So, you know, I'm a very stupid person in the end. And I'm just beginning my studies of both the Bible and the Quran. And I'm still working on the first letter of Taurat, which is Beit, and the first letter of the Quran, which is Ba. And I'm trying to understand the point, the point which is hidden in the house and which becomes apparent in the noble Quran. Someday, inshallah, I'll understand the point. You know, the beloved and I is um, it's a translation of the Bible and it's a commentary of the Quran. I discovered when I tried to translate the Quran that I had put myself an, in an impossible situation. Anyone who needs to be humiliated should try translating the Quran. It's an impossible task. It cannot be translated. I thought that was just some kind of propaganda when I heard that, but when I tried it, I had been reciting the Quran poorly, of course, for 20 years. And I thought I understood it. And even a simple ayat, when you try to translate it, an ayat that you know, and try to translate it, and then you see that you don't understand anything in the end. Translating the Quran creates so much humility that it is inappropriate to be that humble unless you are a very great man or woman. And that means that you've spoiled your life forever. Because you can't be humble enough without looking uh, like a cad. So if I had known what was going to happen to me, I don't know if I would have dared to attempt this, and yet I wouldn't dare not to do it. Now I've taken all this time as an introduction, and uh, I wanted to uh, read a little of uh, uh, The Beloved and I. I live in Finland, and uh, following my Bektashi tradition, I believe that as much as I admire and recite the original languages, I recite in Hebrew and, and Arabic, um, I still think there's a place for the language of the people, the language of the home. I'm writing for English speakers, there are Indonesian speakers, uh, Afrikaans speakers, uh, there is a place for the language of one's mother in, even in the dhikr. And so I took the most obscure of European uh, traditions, Finnish, and I took the Finnish folk harp, which has five strings, and it's described in the Finnish epic. Uh, the first kantele, or Finnish folk harp, was made of fish bones and it had five strings and today it's only played by primary school children and me <laughs> because you're professional as soon as you start with the five strings and given that I'm still working on Beit and Ba and Tawhid I really should only need one string it's a too abundant for me but I 
chose it to show the Finns that Islam can also be expressed in their own language and culture. Uh, it hasn't worked so far. Um, no one wants to hear me uh, singing this. In fact, this is the first time I've been invited anywhere to do this. Although I must say, when I went through the customs, uh, the police at the customs, they saw this cantele uh, and they were wondering. Um, I was a bit old for the second grade, <laughs> but it was always possible. And they were asking me about it, and then they discovered that from my passport that I'm an American. And they looked at me speaking Finnish as fluently as I do. I speak perfect Finnish. I, I told them, I, they said, how do you speak such perfect Finnish? I said, well, I've been here for 40 years, and even a monkey could learn it in that time. <laughs> And he said, where are you going? I'm, I said, I'm going to South Africa. And they said, why are you taking that uh, kantele with you? And I said, well, I've, I've written the Bible and the Quran in the same verse that you have in the Finnish epic Kalevala. And I'm going to sing a little bit of it for them using the Finnish kale, uh, the, uh, kantele. And they looked at me with big eyes. And they said, and did you say you're American? <laughs> I said, yes. And they said, well, have a good trip. And as, as I was walking out, I heard one say to the other, he said, an American like that should have the rights of Finnish citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> now the other day uh, when I started I, I sang a little bit of it and you heard the, uh, the cantale I saw that there were tears in some eyes now I'm going to go back to Finland I sa and tell everyone there that I meet I said none of you have even been curious to hear what it sounds like. And they all know English now. None of you have been curious to, to hear it. And I've been here all these years, and there have been parts ready. I asked the newspaper, are you interested? No, we're not interested. I asked the radio, are you interested? No, we're not interested. Um, I'm going to tell them someone in South Africa was ready to pay for my air ticket so they could hear for three minutes <laughs> this Finnish kantele and this English in the same meter as your epic Kalevala. They're willing to pay for an expensive plane ticket and no one here even in the city and I could walk and you wouldn't have to pay any transportation and then I'm going to say and there were tears in their eyes when they heard it that'll show them <laughs> But I want to tell you how I became a believer. I told you the other day how I became an unbeliever. Today I want to tell you how I became a believer. I said I had I'd read my, my um, Thomas Aquinas, and of course he copied it from the Islamic philosophers, and that's where he got it all, except the part about Jesus being God, and that is inconsistent with the rest of what he's written. I don't know why no one seems to figure that out. But, but those arguments for the existence of God that I found in Thomas Aquinas that he copied from the Muslim philosophers, I learned those in school, in the religion class, and when I went to the 
a theological seminary, I learned the same thing. And because I was a snot-nosed teenager, I said, but none of these um, arguments are sound. They're not valid. They're not watertight. They have fancy names for all of these reasons for the existence of God, these proofs. Um, they tell you a logical one, for example, tell me it's logical one, for example, and uh, all of these uh, proofs. And I said, this is not convincing. And the teacher said, well, it's in our program, you learn it. And uh, um, I see that you would make a good atheist. And I said, thank you, sir. And he said, what are you thanking me for? And I said, well, that you saw I was a good something. <laughs> so this is how I approach the Quran, as a good atheist. And you know, the Muslim theologians also, they seem to be missing something, although I, I see that there is a slight um, improvement in Islamic theology over Christian theology, besides being consistent, I mean. Um, and that is, uh, God is the creator of speech. Um, Christians lack that, and that's probably why they think the word of God must be God, because they don't realize that God is creator of speech. But I was not convinced by any of the theological arguments. And then the Quran came along and had two minutes on no, I, I can't because I, I, I never run over time because I'm, I'm a Native American and we're on Indian time and we're... I've been making an exception for you all along. I'll tell you what exception I've been making. Every time I hear someone talk about love, you know, all of my evangelical Christian friends, they, they love to talk about love. And... Um, I protect my back because the next moment I know I'm going to get the point in the back. And here I, I hear people talking about love quite a bit and somehow I don't feel like my back is in danger as though I'm going to get the point in it. So I'm, I'm making an exception this weekend. Usually I run when I hear the word love. But um, this is from uh, Surat al-Mu'minun, the believers, and this is appropriate because I became a believer when I read this. Yeah. It's Ayat uh, 20 and 21. In cattle to you've much to learn from their bodies we will churn for you to drink and lots of good for you and you eat as you should on them as well as ships you go and finally get them not slow I hardly ever hear a Christian raise this argument for your glory and praise and to prove your existence in the haze. The fact that cows are good for milk and meat and also for transport when that's a feat is rarely seen as proof perfect that you, beloved, exist to prove the thing that's true. I too love cows, especially cows when young, 
and eager to nurse with a lively tongue. I too love cows, white, speckled with the red, and all in fields of green alfalfa fed. I'll drop my vain philosophy instead, my attributes both positive and not, and know in cows your image has been caught. A stupid teenager. I'm using all the vain philosophy and the theological arguments and acting like a teenager who can't understand that mother is the one who puts the milk on the table and the answer to the existence of God, the question of the existence of God is simple as a cow. The cow is a sign of God. Ayatollah. An ayatollah a cow is an ayatollah. <laughs> the Hindus have a point. Mashallah, I became a believer when I understood that. This is the argument that Christians do not have, and it's right there in the Quran. So beautifully put. And all creation radiating from the cow. God bless the Hindus. And there it was, and I became a believer. For love of the Quran. Now, you asked me to, to read a couple of the surahs at the end, and I've gone over four minutes already, so will you forgive me if I don't do it? <laughs> Okay, quickly. And he wanted it from the, the uh, Quran as well. I mean, this is the Quran. The beloved and I is not the Quran. Please remember. <laughs> Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad lam yulid wa lam yulad wa lam yakullahu kufuwan ahad Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falak min sharri ma khalaq wa min sharri Rasik in the Wakab, Wamin Sharin Nafatha de Phil Okad, Wamin Sharri Hasid in the Hasad. Ismilahi Rahmani Rahim, Ulla Udo Berabin Nas, Malikin Nas, Ilahin Nas. Min Sharil was was il Hanas. Allah the Yuas with Sufisu Durinas, Minal Jinati one Nas. In the name of God, most gracious, merciful, proclaim alone he, God is one, God without need of anyone. He is not born, he sires no son, there is none like him, no, not one. Truly, my beloved, there is none like you, the one and only Allah, Allah, who eternal, absolute, in need of none, truly, my beloved, you alone are one. For you give birth to nothing I may know. In you there is no change, no come and go. You have no birth. You have no source at all. Time, place, inside or out, the earthly ball. Creation is an idol. 
if by it I might attempt to give you space or fit, no way to a color, sequence, sour or sweet, can touch your essence, trace your hands and feet. Invisible to eye and mind above, I cannot know you, I can only love. In the name of God, most gracious, merciful, Say I flee to the Lord of dawn From mischief of created things From darkness mischief coming on From mischief of the blowers on The knots who practice secret arts From mischief of the envious kings or slaves whenever envy starts, or slaves whenever envy starts. Love, let me practice envy in the dawn. I envy red bright clouds you have stepped on. I envy earth caught in your sleeted tears. I envy sky bared to you when rain clears. I envy trees, leaf brushed by both, both your hands. I envy hills where your lost image stands. I envy ground, grass kissed by both your lips. I envy psalms where you live, drunk in sips. I envy temple, mosque, and synagogue where your name hides in sunlight or in fog. I envy sun, moon, stars behind your train. I envy taut day and damp night in vain. Though you escape both times and all compare, I envy my own self to find you there. In the name of God, most gracious, merciful, say I seek refuge with the Lord and cherisher of humankind, the king or ruler without sword. Of humankind all are not blind, but still judge of humankind from the mischief of him who whispers evil in stealth and then withdraws. The one who whispers among lispers into men's hearts with fatal claws who slinks away comes back again. Among the jinns and among men, among the jinns and among men. O oh, my beloved, most gracious, merciful, my Lord and cherisher, my judge and king, I seek my refuge from the wonderful and good as well as from the evil thing. I flee to you from every whispering word, I flee to you from everything that's heard, and from the silences I meet within, and from my good deeds as I flee from sin as I turn from all things in flight to you, I find all things turn from the dark to true. And what was slinking whisper in the ear and arrows through the soul when heard from here becomes your voice of love within my heart, both voice of jinn and every human part. O oh, my beloved, take me out of this world I've read the words attributed to you. I've joined the temples where in prayer I whirled, only to find in every chart and pew mankind's hatred, both for my word and for my silences. Give me another shore. I do not seek your paradise reward. I only seek relief from angel's sword. Let me fall in the punishments of hell rather than meet the faces that repel the divine spark within my heart. It burns, extinguished me, now my beloved, 